Good morning. How's everybody doing? Awesome. Thanks for joining us today for IBM Client Day. Who is here for the first time at OpenStack Summit? Wow, that is awesome. It's really neat to see. So we've been involved in OpenStack since the beginning. And it's really neat to see from summit to summit the growth in attendees and then the growth in folks who have nothing to do or have had no history with OpenStack to date. So uh, I'm Jesse Proudman. I'm the CTO of uh, Bluebox, which is IBM's OpenStack hosted product. I like to start kind of every conversation uh, about IBM Cloud with this slide. This slide talks about the IBM Cloud strategy. You've probably seen it around the venue uh, over the last couple days. Uh, and it was this slide that really made me interested in IBM about a year ago uh, when they acquired Bluebox. So if you think about the OpenStack marketplace, if you think about cloud uh, computing in general, at the end of the day, everybody in the room is trying to deliver solutions. They're trying to deliver solutions to their customers or to their internal users. And those solutions need to be built on some kind of software. That software can be, be built internally. Many companies are doing that, or bought as software as a service. But that software needs a platform to operate on. And so at IBM, that platform is Bluemix. And Bluemix is comprised of containers, Cloud Foundry, uh, and a bunch of services uh, that can be uh, used to build composable applications. But that platform needs an infrastructure to run on. And at IBM Cloud, that infrastructure that we've selected for the future state of, of uh, our product line is OpenStack. So that's not necessarily novel. We, we all kind of recognize that, that pattern and trend, the OpenStack piece for IBM is, is, uh, is a great, uh, it's a great foundation. But what's really unique about the IBM strategy is this notion of locality. So public cloud obviously is uh, a dominant force in the industry. Uh, and public, we have public Bluemix, we'll have public OpenStack uh, capabilities, we have those in beta today. Um, so that, that's not particularly unique, but what is interesting to me and what was interesting a year ago was this notion of a consistent experience across public, dedicated, and local and delivering that as a service instead of as software. So what do I mean by dedicated and local? Dedicated is a single tenant hosted installation running in SoftLayer. So we have uh, 25 plus data centers around the globe uh, that we can install this stack dedicated to a single customer in. And then local means in a customer's data center or site of, of choice. And so the key here is that both that dedicated and that local option is delivered as a service. We're getting rid of this notion of shipping software, and we're trying to bring that experience that you get from a public cloud perspective into the world of, of private cloud, into the world of your data center. So that, that's what's particularly interesting to me. And if you look at this space, I think there have been a lot of entrants in the last year and a half, and there's been a lot of interest in this notion of, of consumption as a service. Uh, and it's a great way for organizations who are very interested in OpenStack and who want to get the power and benefit of OpenStack to try it or to, to interface with it without having dealing with a lot of the struggle and the upgrade cycles and, uh, and the, the technology sort of debt that exists with, with the OpenStack platform itself. So that said, uh, we have IBM Client Day today. We, we have a bunch of our distinguished engineers and, and uh, uh, best folks here today to share a bunch of content with you. We're going to start this morning with OpenStack for Beginners, which for the audience in the room sounds like it's a great place to start. Uh, then we'll move in to talk about the, the open cloud. So Jason McGee will get into more detail on that public dedicated local strategy and how those all uh, work together to create a seamless experience for you. Uh, we'll move on to talking about uh, IBM Blue Box, so the dedicated and local OpenStack product uh, uh, working with CloudSoft, which is a application deployment tool set. So doing some uh, conversation around how that operates on the platform and how it utilizes some of the the capabilities with the SoftLayer private network to do multi-data center configurations. Uh, Mark Shuttleworth will be joining us this afternoon to talk about Linux One uh, and Ubuntu. So that's the uh, mainframe that runs Linux. Uh, then we've got Kyle Mestri, who, who'll be talking about one network to rule them all. So this is OVS, OVN, and Courier. How do we get integrated networking across bare metal, VMs, and containers within OpenStack itself, which I think is one of the, the key drivers uh, of folks consuming OpenStack. We've talked a lot about containers. You've talked a lot about bare metal. All those pieces exist. Now, how do we get them operating in a, in a consistent network domain, which is a little bit harder than, than one may think. Then at, uh, at 4.20, we'll be doing a, a networking event in here. We've got uh, a raffle for an iPad and some posters that were done by the IBM Design Center here in Austin. They're pretty awesome posters. 
Um, so there are uh, little tickets that you can fill out and drop in a bowl at the back. Uh, and if you haven't done that yet, you can go grab one of the tickets. that will be by the door uh, and put that in. So we'll, we'll draw that, uh, that ticket at 420. We also have uh, beers and soda in the room. So I think it's the coffee break in general. There'll be coffee in the hall, beer and sodas in here. Uh, so come join us for that. And then we'll end the day uh, talking about urban code deploy uh, and its integration of, of heat and patterns uh, on top of OpenStack. So again, 420, come join us for the, the posters and the beers. And now I will turn it over to Tyler to talk about uh, OpenStack for beginners. Thanks, Jesse. So when you look at OpenStack overall, um, you know, it, it seems really complex when you're new to it. There, there's all these projects, there's different working groups and the foundation and companies and distributions and, and it, it seems really unwieldy. But when you really start to look at the pieces, it, it starts to make a lot more sense. So the basic level, um, OpenStack is a cloud operating system. Um, the idea is it's a layer, a control layer, that we can use to integrate um, and deliver components, whether it's compute, storage, networking, uh, now containers, uh, DNS, key management, all sorts of other projects. But, but it really comes down to just supplying them as a service in an easy way to consume. So it's, a, uh, it's all open source, obviously. Um, it's all focused on providing particular cloud services. Currently, there are 54 official projects. Um, which, is, which is a change last year. There was a governance change to a thing called uh, Big Tent, and that's when that changed. So now there's 54 official projects. All of these projects or services com communicate via APIs. So it was a key uh, design, design decision right from the beginning was, you know, we can't use back-channel ways of communicating. They have to do it via the APIs because that's really the only way it's going to scale. Um, it was originally started uh, between a collaboration between Ra uh, Rackspace and uh, NASA. On the first two projects were the compute and object storage projects, um, just about six years ago, and uh, you know to go from basically two projects and two companies six years ago to you know 54 now is is pretty impressive. So um, not too long after it was started, you know there was there's concerns about it only be two organizations running the whole project, so the foundation was created. So that's now the the OpenStack Foundation is a totally separate entity um, that is a nonprofit that operates and, and manages the, the OpenStack community. And it's written, this used to say all, um, now it's predominantly in Python. I, I, I think this is a, a good way, this is a good way to set um, kind of table two is what isn't OpenStack. So it's not a hypervisor. So that's what's, oh, what are you using uh, for virtualization? Oh, we're using OpenStack. Well, okay, that's the control layer, but um, it supports a wide number of hypervisors, including uh, VMware vSphere, Hyper-V, KVM, Zen, and on and on and on. It's not a free VMware replacement. This is, this is where I see companies getting themselves into trouble. They're like, hey, we, we pay a lot of money for VMware licenses. Can we just do this free OpenStack thing instead? It usually doesn't end well. And it's more similar to AWS than VMware. So the idea that the instances are mostly ephemeral, that we can you know, delete them without, without worry because we're scaling them up and down, and, and you're not concerned about any one individual instance. It's also not a product in and of itself. So if you want to use OpenStack, how are you going to get it? You know, if you're going to get it through a service provider like Bluebox, a distribution provider like, like Mirantis or Canonical, and it's not a single distribution there either. So, you know, there's a, a, a pretty large number of distributions and ways to consume OpenStack, and also you can just get the, the raw bits directly off GitHub if you want as well. And it's not a single open source project, so that's when people, oh, we're using OpenStack. Well, which of the 54 projects are you using? Because you don't have to use them all. It sounds, you know, daunting that there's 54 projects, but um, you can pick and choose to put together the solution that makes sense for you if you want containers or you don't, or you want, you know, object storage or you don't. Um, it's not a storage platform, it's not network virtualization in and of itself. So the components that do the network virtualization use plugins to support things like OVS and OVN or commercial um, products like uh, from Juniper and Cisco, but in and of itself, it's not a network virtualization platform. So what, why does it matter? Why, you know, why are we all here you know, this, this week and, and, and come together every six months? Is it 
one of the only open source projects that provides the full um, comprehensive cloud services framework. So not just VMs, not just uh, some storage. It's you know all these other services. Some pretty significant um, cloud service providers are using OpenStack as their platform, and um, and what we really see this is is this is the next. Um, generation after Linux is OpenStack will have that really big impact of bringing open source uh, to customer environments. This is a uh, Google Trends uh, that I clipped uh, not too long ago, but this is just basically search on all those different open source cloud options. Uh, and you can see OpenStack starting in 2010 uh, is now pretty much uh, taken over this space. So how did, how did we get here? As I mentioned, 2010 started with NASA and Rackspace. Uh, in 2011, the very first public cloud launches uh, built on OpenStack. In 2012, that's when the foundation was created. Uh, 2013, Grizzly. So if you're not familiar, each of the releases uh, get a name, and it's alphabetical. So the current release that we're, we're working on now is N, which is Newton. So the Grizzly release added block storage and networking. 2014, the OpenStack marketplace opens. So if you go to the, the foundation's website, you'll see there's, there's a lot of um, full information on all the different ways you can get OpenStack. Um, the big change last year, as I mentioned, was going to the Big Tent model. So there used to be a totally different model for bringing new projects into OpenStack. So we switched to this new model last year, and it's been, uh, it's been pretty successful so far. Last year, also from a size perspective, uh, CERN announced that their, uh, their OpenStack cloud hit 150,000 cores. So we, and, and this year, we just had the Mitaka release just came out just before, uh, just before we got here. So Shamal's going to uh, come up and talk about more about the community aspects of uh, OpenStack. Thank you, Tyler. So th thanks for that overview in history. Uh, so OpenStack, as Tyler explained, you know a little bit of what it what its purpose is, what it's used for, what it's not potentially used for, and you know misconceptions, if you will. But really, OpenStack itself is part technology and part community. A lot of people that participate in OpenStack are here for the community aspect of it. Um, you'll find very helpful people. Tyler alluded to working groups before. And whatever your interest is, whether you're an enterprise customer, a telco customer, uh, you're in academic, scientific research areas, et cetera, you'll find people with that interest to collaborate with and work together to achieve whatever the use case is that you have. So some stats on the community itself, um, just phenomenal in terms of growth and, and size at this point. Uh, there's over 589 companies based on the last annual report, and over 170 members are from over 170 countries. There's about 34,000 individual members in the foundation, and to give you in perspective, this number at the last annual report was somewhere around 30. This number is from like the annual report that just came out, and I believe I heard Jonathan at one point say that we're closer to like probably 40 or 50 even at this point. So very tremendous growth rate. Massive developer community, uh, over 5,600 developers. And by the way, this is lifetime, so this is not disk release. This is overall lifetime of the project. And over 260 commits. Uh, so these are not lines of code. These are actually commits of code. So very massive scale from a community perspective as well. And the community is very helpful to each other. From a release perspective, as Tyler mentioned, uh, generally the releases are named in alphabetical, alphabetical order. The naming scheme is based on the city where the design summit happened. So generally, when you pick a place, um, like Mitaka, for example, was when the Tokyo design summit was happening. So you pick a name that represents the location where the software was built or, or designed. And there's generally two rele major releases every year. One of the other changes that's happened recently is projects don't necessarily have to release every six months. So while bulk of the projects do release every six months, some projects have the capability to release more frequently. So the newer projects do actually tend to release faster, but then the more established uh, projects and you know the course, the services that have been consumed the most and adopted the most do tend to follow the six-month release cadence. The other important thing to note is the support structure within the community. The community generally supports up to N minus one from a community perspective. Vendors and product developers, they can actually support greater than this. So there's distributions and companies out there that will support you, you know, still on Juno or Kilo. But from a community perspective, once uh, a release is cut, um, there's an EOL date established with it. So for example, uh, Mitaka just came out, the EOL is TBD. The previous release was Liberty, and it's gonna, e it's gonna be end of life in November when um, the next release, Newton, comes out. 
But what this also means is uh, for the first six months, you can actually put in critical bug fixes as long as they're backported from, like you have to commit them to a new branch first and then backport them. Or um, if there's security fixes, they can actually go you know, more than 12 months even because security, obviously, if there's a vulnerability, we have to address it. Now, I'm not gonna go over all the different services, whether it's block storage, compute, et cetera, um, but what I will say is, for the most part, most OpenStack services kind of follow this architecture. There's an API layer, and the API generally provides like create, read, update, delete type functions against the infrastructure resource that you're pooling. Uh, below that, you have something that schedules and decides, okay, which actual host or storage provider is gonna fulfill the request that just came in, and then below that, you have the service, which is interfacing with the infrastructure itself. And then usually that's through a form of a driver or plugin, and there's a provider. And as Tyler mentioned, between services, it's usually RESTful APIs. Inside the service, we use a message queue, and we send like remote procedure calls over the message queue, more or less. And so even in the service layer, they, they try to decouple each of these functions as much as possible so you can scale them individually. Uh, and as well as between services, it's decoupled because it's all RESTful calls anyway. The other thing I want to kind of highlight here is, um, and since most of you are first-time summit attendees and some of you might be researching OpenStack, there's two resources, that, or a resource that came out in the last summit called the Project Navigator by the Foundation. And it's a phenomenal resource because if you go in Project Navigator, you see you know, the various services, you, you get a description of what they do, so you can tell that Nova is a compute service, but then there's also seven or eight criteria, actually eight criteria that we've defined of does it have an install guide? Is it packaged in a lot of the distributions that are available? Is the release team releasing on a regular schedule? And so basically, we, we use these attributes to kind of give a maturity score to the service. So this gives you a good idea of, you know, Nova, for example, I think meets seven out of the eight criteria, or maybe eight out of the eight. The newer projects will be less, but that kind of shows you that, okay, I, I can do this service, but it is newer. So you kind of know what to expect when you're uh, getting into a service. But likewise, there's links to the relevant docs there, and then there's also additional information. So if you go on Keystone, for example, you can click there and you see who the project uh, team lead is, which is Steve Martinelli, and you see like, you know, which, um, most active con who are the most active contributors to that space, et cetera. It's a very useful tool as you're looking into researching and, and uh, consuming OpenStack. And the list of capabilities, so now as I've described service architecture, the list of capabilities is ever-growing as well. And so the way to kind of look at it is there's services that provide like infrastructure as a service components. Then there are services, because OpenStack clouds can be massively uh, scalable, there are services that actually help you monitor and manage the cloud itself through either telemetry or better provisioning tools or even testing the code and, you know, for stability and whatnot. And then there's advanced services that kind of give you the experience of consuming IaaS but providing a value add service on top of it. So at this layer, you have things like being able to do database as a service, or being able to leverage the other IaaS resources to do DNS management, key management, et cetera. And through all of this, because services kind of talk to each other and they authenticate through tokens, Keystone is a common con component used both for user authentication as well as helps out with service-to-service -service communication. And then from a development perspective, since there's so many projects, instead of you know, building the same function over and over in different projects, anything that's like kind of a common need in the community, they have a common set of libraries that they've defined called Oslo, which captured that need. So basically, we reduce duplicity of code as well as reduce potential errors because everyone's using the same function calls, more or less. And the other thing that I'd like to mention is just use cases in general. OpenStack is you know, not built for one specific use case. It's not just you know, it's for test dev. People are using it for all sorts of environments, test dev, QA, production, and for all sorts of workloads. And there's actually, I don't have the URL here, but there's actually a website where if you go to openstack.org slash user dash stories, you can see public references in all sectors that are using OpenStack. So I'll give you a really good idea of what types of companies with which backgrounds and what size are consuming OpenStack. Furthermore, um, Tyler and I, along with the Enterprise Working Group recently, um, just authored this book, which is, which is coming out at this summit, called OpenStack Path to Cloud. And this is actually a second part of a series that the Enterprise Work Group has been working on. The first part was a business primer on OpenStack. So it was about how do you do the research and justify you know, how to look for ROI, TCO, so making the business decision to go with cloud and OpenStack in particular. 
This, this second book in the series is more about you've made the decision to go OpenStack, so what are your choices? As Tyler mentioned, the different cloud deployment uh, consumption models you have, there's different deployment models, whether it's public, private, hybrid, community, et cetera. And then there's also the decision of which workloads do I start with to maximize my success uh, probability of you know, getting funding, getting more users on board, et cetera. And so this book contains all of this. It's an ebook, so it's available at openstack.org slash enterprise. Tyler and I also have maybe like four or five copies, so if anyone wants one, we'll be glad to give one. Uh, but again, as you get started into community, you know, it's, it's good to kind of understand the services and research, you know, how do you make the business case to help your OpenStack deployment be successful, along with the technical, uh, finding someone who, who to work with that has the technical capabilities to make you successful as well. But then also, as I mentioned, the community, getting involved is important as well. So there's tons of ways to get involved in the community, whether it's joining the foundation, joining mailing lists, attending meetings on IRC, helping with code, or even just doing reviews of code. Um, so tons of ways to get involved. Um, but with that, I'm gonna pass it on to Brad, who's gonna share how IBM actually is involved with OpenStack. Thank you. What's that? Oh, no, I don't need those fancy devices. It's really that book. Anyway. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, so I want to talk to you all about um, how IBM has been involved in OpenStack, uh, particularly in contributing. Uh, one of the interesting things about an open source community like OpenStack is, well, how do you have influence? Well, do you show up with a fancy title or a big thing of money or, uh, you know, a fancy degree? None of that really works. Uh, OpenStack as a, as a community, you have influence by rolling up your sleeves and becoming a contributor. And you become a contributor by uh, starting to learn, do some bug fixes, and maybe do some doc documentation fixes, and you get to know the other contributors. Um, I learned this firsthand. I started contributing to OpenStack uh, you know, at the end of 2012. Um, and I, I hid the fact that I had a fancy IBM title, and I hid the fact that I had a PhD, and I just kind of rolled up my sleeves and was junior programmer, right? Learning the ropes of OpenStack. Uh, I think I went about eight months before people realized I actually was an executive at IBM, technical executive, and then they looked at me funny for about two weeks, uh, and then they got over it. Um, but, but that's what you do. If you want to have influence, nobody cared that I had a PhD, nobody cared I had a fancy IBM title. It was, well, Brad, how, how are you helping the, the community? How are you helping the software? What can you contribute? So with that, if you look at IBM, uh, since the early days here, we've been wrapping, uh, ramping up our contributions. Uh, going all the way up to where we are in Mataka now with 42 core contributors. Um, you know, over 200 technical contributors, over 500 people at IBM helping to push OpenStack in some fashion, go to market capabilities, business development, what have you, and uh, making key contributions um, in, in, in all of these. Um, we've really been ramping up and we've got a lot to be proud of. Um, Number one and commits and reviews to Keystone. Number two and commits to Nova. Number one and commits to Senlin. Number one and commits and reviews to Barbican, RefStack. Um, lots of these projects. Uh, we've also been ramping up our leadership. Uh, we've got nine project uh, technical leads. So key projects: Keystone, Glance, Nova, RefStack, uh, Heat Translator, Senlin. Uh, we've, we, and, you know, these people are elected by their peers in the community, and, uh, you know, they've, they've worked their way up for many a year to, to have those leadership positions, and it, it helps us to drive the changes that customers want. That's what's important is to drive the uh, enhancements, features that we need, and that's why we invest so much in OpenStack to, to be able to do that. So if you look at there, you know, lots of commits, lots of contributions. Um, where do we spend time contributing? Uh, if you look at where we do a lot of the main projects, uh, security, you know, we have a lot of enterprise customers. So security and integration with things like LDAP and Active Directory and Federated Identity, these are things that we've been driving uh, since the beginning. 
I, I remember when I first started working on OpenStack, um, the identity component of it, which is just called Keystone, uh, didn't even have a secure connection to LDAP. So if you were going to connect to your LDAP, you didn't even have a secure connection. It's kind of a problem. I actually put in the, the TLS connection myself uh, between Keystone and LDAP. So little features that enterprises typically like to see in something we want to make enterprise strength. Um, if you look at storage, uh, IBM's been huge in, in various capabilities of storage. Um, if you think what we call uh, migration, retyping, so if you want to you know, use the block storage and go from one back end, an IBM back end, to another vendor's back end, we call that retyping. We've done a lot of work in uh, the migration, supporting migration, and also replication. We've embraced the, the database as a service capabilities of OpenStack, and we'll talk a little more about those. Uh, containers, we'll talk about in more detail, but containers and networking and how those two work together are other areas where IBM's been huge because we and our customers see how important it is for OpenStack to provide you an infrastructure that allow you to run containers on top and allow you to have some really nice seamless networking options. We've also been working, you know, about uh, core networking issues, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit of that on another chart. Um, got lots of cores working on the dashboard. Made the dashboard extensible so that operators can add more features to the dashboard if they need it. Uh, adding features like Angular JS uh, improved the performance as well. Um, Another area we've been huge is interoperability. So folks want OpenStack uh, deployments to be interoperable, and we've set up a project called RefStack and lead it that, that help drive where you know, folks can send in their results and we can validate, yes, these things are interoperating as, as we've said they would passing the tests. Um, so if we want to go into more details about where we're contributing, um, networking. So, anybody looked at OpenStack networking yet? Yeah, not too many. So, here's what you're going to see. Um, been doing a lot of work uh, with these things called OVS, OVN, improving the scalability uh, for L2, L3 networking capabilities that OpenStack provides. Uh, doing a lot of work in providing monitoring, troubleshooting tools. As you do this advanced networking, um, and the networking capabilities that OpenStack offers, uh, you got to start getting comfortable with these advanced networking topics, and we're trying to make it easier to learn those, debug those. Uh, another area where we've seen a lot of pickup, anybody from telcos? Anybody here from a telco company? All right. Which telco company from? Which one? Excellent. How about the, the other person behind you? Nope, oh, you went to sleep. So. Uh, you know, if you look at it, we get a huge pickup from the telcos um, in an area that they call network function virtualization. And they're seeing OpenStack as a great way to do all this network function virtualization. And um, we've been putting, you know, the pieces in place so that the folks in the NFV world can embrace the OpenStack world. Now, what does that mean? If you look at what the telcos are like, they like a standard-based approach, and they're actually using one called Tosca uh, with creating these things called the standard profiles for all their network function and virtualization. Eventually, all that stuff has to be translated and mapped down to stuff that OpenStack does, namely heat and hot templates. We actually lead some projects that allow that translation to occur so that all the things that they love to specify can then map down to OpenStack. So we've been doing a lot of work there and helping out the NFV-related projects in OpenStack. One of them is called Tasker, uh, Tacker, rather, to, to, to help that area. Um, storage and, you know, database, right? So again, I've, I've mentioned, uh, you know, block storage, we've been huge volume, um, migration, uh, retyping, replication. Been doing a lot of quality uh, enhancements in those areas to make sure that stuff works the way we claim it's going to work. Uh, obviously, we've been improving our own drivers with replication capabilities. Um, we've also been doing some work with the object storage of, of OpenStack, which is called Swift, not to be confused with the Apple language. It's, you know, when, you, when you're IBM and you do open source projects, because that's all we do these days is open source. and 
you've got OpenStack Swift, and then you've got Apple Swift, which is also open, swor uh, open source. It gets quite confusing. So this is the, the one that's part of OpenStack, uh, you know, adding features there for container synchronization. We've also been doing a lot of work with improving the database as a service option of OpenStack. It's a neat feature, um, and we've been adding support for CouchDB, which is a you know open source database that's very popular, as well as our own DB2 and providing capabilities there that allow those databases to run seamlessly as part of an OpenStack environment. So we've been having a lot of fun with the uh, Trove team driving those kinds of enhancements. Um, you know, lately in security, there's a new project for storing keys and secrets called Barbican. Our folks have been um, adding features to that to, to make it better and, um, you know, uh, extra capabilities there. Um, the main component for security is called Keystone. It does your identity, authentication, access management for all of OpenStack. It's what you use to integrate into LDAP, integrate into uh, Active Directories or an identity manager. Um, we've been doing a lot of work there and most recently quality improvements as well as adding uh, the notion of um, domain specific sp uh, policy support. So if you have different domains, different groups, different what have you, that need different security policies. Uh, a lot of uh, work is being done in that area to, to make that more seamless and, and, and more fine-grained uh, security policy capabilities there. Um, containers. Anybody interested in containers? Any hands? Anybody? It's got to be more than that. It's, it's a hot topic. Don't be shy. Um, containers are huge. We've got folks working in the container project, uh, which is Magnum of OpenStack, and you know that improves the ability of OpenStack to, to support things like Mesos, uh, Swarm, and Kubernetes. And then there's also, you know, containers are so popular, there's also work being done to improve the networking capabilities for the containers, so that you have a container and it can get an IP address and it runs seamlessly to what else you need in the rest of your environment. There's a project called Courier. So, uh, you know, the, our folks have been working to make sure that overall story of the containers and the networking uh, is, is a seamless story. Is there more work to be done there? Absolutely. We're just going to keep pounding away at it. Uh, you can see the list there of, of things that we're doing. Um, but we're really trying to bridge those worlds and, and make that a seamless experience for folks that love the containers and love the open stack. Um, compute, uh, people familiar with the compute part of OpenStack Nova? Uh, you know, we're doing a huge amount of bug fixes. Our big contributions there are, you know, the leader in bug fixes and improved scheduling support. So, uh, you know, improving, uh, you know, it's a very established part of OpenStack. It's one of the main things you'll use, and, and we just continue to improve the quality. We also do some incubators. Uh, there's a policy for auto-scaling project called Senlin. We've been uh, having a lot of success with uh, uh, telecommunication companies in China using that to, to improve their scaling. So, um, you know, a lot of work being done there as well. Um, and some of us actually even write some books. And some of us actually bring more than four or five copies to the conference. So um, we actually have a book signing today. And we don't have four or five. We do have four or 500. Um, please come see us one to two, myself and the other authors, uh, Steve Martinelli and Henry Nash, uh, Keystone Cores, will be at the booth. And if you're not familiar, we'll cover Keystone, which if you're new to OpenStack, typically the first thing you gotta figure out is the security, how you're gonna integrate into your existing uh, LDAPs, Active Directories, or your identity options. And so that's typically the first problems you hit, and fortunately we got a nice O'Reilly book um, to, to, to get you started. We'll be there one to two, uh, come sign. Uh, who wants this one, anybody? First hand one up. Oh, I'm so happy I didn't bust his nose open and the stitches, that would have been terrible. Um, and then if you want to read more, uh, there's some places you can uh, read more. Uh, there's some, you can just uh, Google out there, uh, you know, for my name or whatever. I've got some open tech articles that you can look at and uh, different things you can find. Um, but it's usually pretty easy because I've been blasting out on Twitter for the last three or four weeks incessantly. 
Um, all right, well, you know, we'll be happy to take any questions. Um, any questions at all? Um, anything or no? We're going to have our next speaker up is going to be talking about the cloud market and, and opportunities and um, uh, going to be talking about our modern cloud stack. So please stick around for that. And I think that speaker is going to get uh, set up as we speak. So don't be shy. Always come talk to us.